Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask that your spirit would fall afresh on us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We held him and took he, until he took his last breath. His name was Knockout. We had him for 13 years. He was a purebred boxer. And his organs were shutting down. And for those of you that have had pets, you know how difficult that is. And as someone said earlier, they become a member of your family. And you miss them. And it just so happened that we had planned a trip. And he passed away. We, we put him down the day before we left on this trip. And so here we are the next day. We're flying out. We're thinking about him. And also thinking, you know, this could be a good distraction to help us get through. And so we landed in Reykjavik, Iceland, the following day. And I uh, have some pictures that I'd like to share with you. Uh, let's see if we can move along. This is the city. It's near the ocean, and uh, they eat a lot of seafood, um, and we don't. So <laughs> we, we bought our food from the local market, and we cooked our own food. Um, but Iceland is a very unique place, and some of you have visited very interesting places. Um, Iceland has volcanoes and lots of uh, mountains and geysers and waterfalls. In fact, we, we counted on a five-mile stretch 60 waterfalls as we were heading uh, to a beach one day. And I'll share a little bit more about that beach later on. But the one thing that stood out, the one thing that I'll never forget, is one night we were driving back from a national park. And it was late. And uh, we saw some lights over us. And, and then we, we decided we're going to pull over because this is the moment where the northern lights just exploded over our heads. Now, we had seen them a couple days earlier, uh, glimpses of purple and green and turquoise, but nothing like this. This was mesmerizing, and the color was orange. And we just sat there looking, and, and as the lights danced from left to right, and uh, it was quite a scene. And then, of course, other colors joined in. And uh, I just will never forget that moment. And I, I turned to my wife, and we just looked at each other like, this was a gift from God to be able to see something so spectacular. And it also got us thinking about the end times. What is it going to be like when Jesus comes and he just explodes and, he's, he's, and it's bright and it's trumpets and it's angels and it's... Can you just imagine what that's going to be like and, and how, how you're going to get some goosebumps and, and you're going to get excited if we should have the privilege of seeing that day. It, it's going to be amazing. Uh, and we've already seen and experienced some amazing signs. And today I wanted to focus on the signs. Uh, there's actually something that I've been studying, and it has to do with the signs and the parable. Now, oftentimes when we look at parables, we... We don't often think about them as having a, a secret or a key to helping us understand other parts uh, of the signs in Matthew chapter 24. But in this particular parable, we're going to look at these two and, uh, and see that there's some fascinating, encouraging, and sobering things that God wants us to consider. So let's go to Matthew chapter 24. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Matthew 24. 
and we'll start reading verses uh, one and on. And if you don't have your Bibles, uh, we have it on the screen as well. And so here we are reading from the New King James Version. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and disciples came up to him, showing him the building of the temple. And he said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now this was an incredible statement. In fact, if you were a disciple, there is no doubt that your eyes would have gotten this big. And your blood pressure might have gone up. And you would have thought to yourself, how is that possible? What Jesus is saying, because the temple was a magnificent structure. Some scholars say that when it was at its peak, when it was the biggest and the most beautiful, it was 450 acres. Now here we are in Jesus' time, and the structure is not as large, but it's still a sight to behold. Would you agree with me? And when Jesus starts talking about the temple and letting him know that this, although incredible structure, is not going to be, they thought, this has to be the end. This has to be it, because what else, what other event could take down such an incredible place? And so uh, they asked him afterwards, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. And then he goes on to list many different signs. And I'm just going to share 12 with you. But this is just a condensed list. Jesus went on and on in the whole chapter. And he's starting to answer the question by telling them there's going to be false Christ and there's going to be wars and nations against nations and famines and pestilence and earthquakes. We just had a terrible earthquake last night in Morocco. 800 people lost their lives and counting. Uh, Doug talked about hurricane. We've got a hurricane that's formed, Hurricane Lee, and it's a Category 5, and now it's losing it, its strength, but it might gain its strength down the road. And, and you know, there's only been so many Category 5 hurricanes. There's been, uh, there's been 40 uh, total uh, since 1924. However, 20% uh, of the hurricanes that uh, have been Category 5, we have seen in the last 10 years. So the frequency and the intensity and the things that are happening out there, surely they are signs that Jesus is coming soon. Amen? Amen. There's going to be hatred, unfortunately. There's going to be false prophets. Uh, we, we see this all the time in the news, and it's just hard to even watch the news any, a, anymore because it's just full of violence and, and, and talk about the love of many will grow cold. And yet the gospel will, will be preached throughout the whole world. There's still the, well, there's the abomination of desolation. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall, and that has happened. Could happen again. And so you see all these things taking place. They took place in the past. They're taking place now. And it just points to Jesus coming back. There are signs. There are things happening. And we are left uh, to consider and uh, watch and pray. And Jesus went on to talk about all the things that we should look out for and the things that we should be doing. And yet, there's this parable at the end. And if you just read it very quickly, you might not think that there's a strong connection between the parable and the signs. But let's take a look at that parable to see this strong connection. Um, Jesus ends this discourse with the disciples regarding the three questions that they have by sharing this parable. In other words, he's, 
he started to answer the question with the signs, and he continued in the middle of the chapter. But then here's the end, and I believe it is here where he's answering their question uh, in, a, in, a, in a very deep, uh, very I interesting way. And so let's read the parable. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants, his household, to give them their food at their proper time? It will be good for the servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. Now, some versions say, my Lord. Now, note that. My master or my Lord is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of the servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now I want us to take a look at these two servants. There's the wise servant and there's the evil or wicked servant. Now, there's an interesting Greek word here to describe the wise servant. And the Greek word is phronimos. It's a very interesting word. And uh, it means one who is wise, but also one who controls his or her diaphragm. Now, this caught me off guard because I was not expecting this. What does that mean? have to do with being wise? What would your breathing have to do with being wise? Well, we know that um, when they're trying to see if you're lying, you have a lie detector, and what are they monitoring? Your breathing. Breathing, because when you lie, you you breathe differently. And so, and, and so, but this still, I was just trying to figure out. Well, but but what does that have to do with with this? Well, if you start looking at the Greek word and the wise servant, and you contrast that with the evil servant, the wise servant is actually helping his fellow man by providing food. He's caring for him. He's, he probably has a relation, some type of good relationship with him if he's caring for him. Would you guys agree with that? Amen. And so when we have good relationships, guess what happens to our breathing? It's relaxed. It's normal. It's good breathing. And so here we have this, this word that's trying to help us understand when we engage in community service and we're looking after people and we're caring for them. We can breathe easy. We can sleep well at night because we're following God's commands. And, and so here we have the word phronimos. But now to describe the evil servant, we have a different word, and that is the word um, and I'll, let's go, well, actually, let's stop right here. Desire of Ages, page 634. Listen to how Ellen White describes the wise servant. Those who watch for the Lord's coming are not waiting in idle expectancy. The expectations of Christ's coming is to make men fear the Lord and fear his judgments upon transgression. It is to awaken them to the great sin of rejecting his offer of mercy. Now, listen to the two words or phrases that she wants us to catch on to. Those who are watching for the Lord are purifying their souls by obedience to the truth. With vigilant watching, she uses the word watch or watching three times. But then she uses, they combine earnest working because they know that the Lord is at the door. Their zeal is quickened to cooperate with the divine intelligences in working for the salvation of souls. They are faithful and wise servants who give to the Lord's household their portion of meat in due season. So she's telling us to watch, which also means pray. Watching and praying go hand in hand. 
We see that in Scripture. But she's also saying, you can watch and you can pray, but that's not enough. You actually have to be doing something. We've got to be working for the souls of men. And so she says, when you have this combination of not only watching and praying and being aware of the times that we're living in, and we combine that with working, and when I say working, I mean it's not just an office that you hold a church, but actually it's connecting with the community Amen. and taking care of their needs. Amen. As we have been told, Ministry of Healing, page 143, Christ's method alone is he ministered to their needs. Amen. So as we're ministering to needs and watching and waiting, we're doing exactly what God wants us to do in the end times. But now we have to talk about the evil servant. The Greek word for evil is kakos. And kakos means dug a guitar that's out of tune. It means an apple that was once ripe and ready to be eaten, and now it is rotten. It is rotten. At once, at, at some point, this evil uh, servant uh, might have been good. Something happened. He lost his way. He, he changed. He, he went downhill. He, he calls his master Lord. Could it be that at one point he was religious or spiritual? And now something happened in his heart, maybe slowly over time. And um, we consider four things about him. He, since he calls his master Lord, we may say that he was religious. But we know for sure that he's beating people up. He's mistreating them. And what happens when you get into an argument with someone? Or what happens when... When, when you're not taking care of your fellow man, in fact, your breathing changes. Have you ever gotten into a, a fight with someone, a physical fight with someone? Uh, I remember as kids, man, sometimes we would get into it, and uh, your breathing changes. You start, <gasps> he's pleasure-seeking, he's drinking, and that's all he's thinking about. And he's not expecting his master, in this case, he's not expecting Jesus to come back. So what does Jesus want, to be, want us to be doing in the last days? Now, this is a sobering paragraph from Desire of Ages. In thinking about the evil servant, the world full of riding, full of godless pleasure, is asleep, asleep in carnal security. Men are putting afar off the coming of the Lord. They laugh at warnings. They, they proud, uh, proudly bo uh, proud boast is made. The proud boast is made. All things continue as they were from the beginning. Tomorrow shall be as this day and much more abundant. We will go deeper into pleasure loving. But Christ says, behold, I come as a thief. Revelation 16, 15. At the very time when the world is, ask, is asking in scorn, where is the promise of his coming? The signs are fulfilling. While they cry peace and safety, sudden destruction is coming. When the scorner and the rejecter of truth has become presumptuous, when the routine of work and the various money-making lines is carried on without regard to principle, when the student is eagerly seeking knowledge of everything but his Bible, Christ comes as a thief. And yet he wants us to be taking care of those that are in need. Matthew 25, 31 through 40, but we'll just read um, a portion of this. When the king will say to those on his right hand, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared before you from the foundation of the world, for I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you 
visited me. I was in prison and you carried, you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothed you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And then, if we are watching and praying and working for the Lord and helping those that are in need, God will say to us, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. I want to end with, with a story. There was one day when we were in Iceland where we went to a place called Vik Beach. The stones are black. The sand is black. And it's a, it's a very beautiful place. And here we are and we're just walking along and talking and looking out into the ocean and watching the waves and just feeling the breeze and just really enjoying it. And uh, I love to take pictures. So I had my camera with me and my tripod and I'm setting up, I'm taking all different types of, of pictures. Uh, my wife sometimes asks me, how many pictures can you get of one particular spot? I said, well, you know, technically, you know, you could get hundreds depending on the angle. You just move, you know, the camera up or down. And, and so here we are taking pictures. And what happened was apparently when I went into my pocket um, to grab uh, camera equipment, I dropped my phone. And it's very similar in size. And it's, it's black. It's got a black, black... Um, protector and 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 so and I I didn't know that till you know almost what was it an hour later we we're, just, we're walking hundreds of yards going east west north south and then it starts to get dark and um, there's a few more pictures my wife waiting patiently on these shots and here we are it's the sun is setting and it's time to get in the car to go back to the Airbnb and I realized I didn't have my phone and we had used the GPS to get there and there was a lot of windy roads it wasn't just route you know what's the main route here 26. It wasn't just 26 to get there. It was three hours of windy roads and some highway. And, and I s told my wife, honey, I think I dropped my phone. And we look out, and it's just black. That's all you saw. And I thought, how, how is this going to work? We really need that GPS to get back. And we don't know anyone there. And... We're alone. We're back. We're the last ones on the beach. Everyone's gone. It's just the two of us. I mean, you would think that's a perfect romantic moment. Except we were worried about getting back. It was like, it, it, you know, we, we weren't in the mood to hold hands, let's just say. And so she says, well, we, we need to retrace your steps. I said, honey, we been walking hundreds of yards in every direction. And, and I started to retrace what I thought were my steps. I went back and forth. I didn't see anything. Everything looked the same. And she said to me, we have to pray. Amen. And that's a great idea. And we prayed. We prayed and and I said, well, let's, let's divide and conquer. I'll take this part of the beach. You take that part of the beach. And by the way, this beach is just can go on forever. Thankfully, we hadn't walked 
miles, but we walked hundreds and hundreds of yards. And so she went to the left, and I went to the right, and I searched, and I couldn't find anything. And I was just about to give up hope. And I heard my wife, off into the distance. I couldn't hear what she was saying, but I heard her. Does that make sense? She was saying something. And I was like, well, that sounds kind of exciting over there. There's nothing happening over here. So I started walking towards her. She started walking towards me. And I finally saw her. She had the phone in her hand. And she had found the phone. Now, I don't know how she found the phone. This had to have been divine intervention. I've always seen it that way. I've always felt like it was was that. And we found the the phone, or she found the phone, and we were able to put in our our GPS, our our, our address back to um, the the Airbnb, and uh, and here we are. We might have still been back there. Uh, But one of the things that I thought of as I share this story with you is, is the searching part. The Bible tells us that there are many things to consider when it comes to searching. One obvious one is to search the scriptures. Because in them, we find God. And it is so important for God to be speaking to us. In some cases, some scholars would say it's more important for him to speak to us than for us to speak to him. Some would even say that. And so I I love that we get a chance to study the Bible a lot. And we're, for the most part, the Adventist church is a studious bunch, aren't we? And it's great because it's God talking with us. So we have to search the scripture. There are times when, uh, when we talk about searching ourselves and uh, seeing, is there something that I'm missing here? Am, am I watching and praying and am I working for the Lord and the way that he wants me to work for him? And then there are times when, when we miss the mark when we make mistakes, when we venture off places and paths that God would not want us to go down. And it is in those times when something exciting happens. When Adam and Eve sinned, God comes searching for them. Where are you? Things aren't the same. Something has changed in our relationship. And let's get it right. And so today I just wanted to share with you that God comes to our door and he knocks. And I pray that this week we'll open the door and that we will be watching and praying and working for him and caring for those that are in need. And that's the connection. And that's what I believe God wants us to be doing when it comes to Matthew 24. It's knowing the signs and understanding the times that we're living in and also working to help those that are in desperate need. And I believe if we do that, We're in God's will. And what a day it will be when he comes to take us home. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your words, Matthew 24 and 25. Thank you for the counsels that we have through Ellen White, Desire of Ages, that we would consider, Lord, the times that we're living in, And that you would help us as we do our very best to walk with you and talk with you. We want to be faithful. We need your help. Give us your spirit this week. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, as we leave here today, may your spirit go with us. 
Thank you that we can enjoy fellowship and that we can eat together and be encouraged. Bless everyone that came. Be with them and their families. Care for them this week, Lord. Help them to sense your presence. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.